Hello, I am Dan Marino in San Francisco. And I'm Nihal Al-Hadi in Toronto. Welcome to The Conversation Weekly. So Nahal, I'm going to open this episode with a question that feels like it's out of a job interview, so I apologize. But have you ever been in a situation where there was an obvious solution it wasn't getting done, no matter how much you tried to talk it over, suggest solutions, and generally be an agreeable person. I mean, Dan, I parent two children, so that you're basically describing <laughs> every weekday. So what do you do in these situations? So it really depends. A lot of the time I'm just in survival mode and I have to flex my authority and be like, you need to do this right now. Other times it could range from bribery, negotiation, trying to work it out together, explaining to them why I need them to do something, but trying to change behaviors like consistently every day without me reminding them to do it usually takes a lot of work on my part. Mm. Well, I wasn't necessarily expecting to draw a parallel between raising children to the topic today, which is the legal systems of climate change, but I think it's a really apt metaphor. Climate is changing or has changed in a lot of ways. The world knows what to do and for the most part how to do it. And we're at this frustrating point where we just kind of aren't doing the things that need to get done. So in this episode, we are looking at legal tools that are being used today to fight climate change and try and motivate action. And in particular, a new legal pathway that activists and scholars are employing that is particularly tying environmental degradation and global climate change to human rights. So that's a really interesting approach, but will it work? What human rights are being violated? I guess access to quality of life or health or well-being, but how does it get used in the fight against climate change? That is exactly the question that we are going to dig into with our first scholar to get a little better sense of how these environmental cases that are being pushed through human rights channels are playing out in court. I spoke to a scholar who's been following them pretty closely. My name is Niang Sienko. I am a postdoctoral researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Center with Stockholm University in Sweden. My background is in sustainability science, and I work with global environmental policies, but also biodiversity governance in general. Part of Nyok's research looks at projects like dams and mines and how they are implemented around the world. She and a colleague recently published an article with The Conversation about a case taking place in Argentina about one such project. There was a dam being built in southern Argentina which is located in the Patagonia region. So it's a very environmentally endemic area. There's a lot of very rare species living out there. And the dam operator built the dam in a way that was not entirely up to code. There was an environmental impact assessment done, but essentially the dam affects the indigenous Mapuche people living out in the area. And there wasn't very clear guidelines around how they were to actually conduct the public participation. And the dam was affecting both the indigenous people living there, but also this hooded grebe. Uh, this species only exists in this part of Patagonia and nowhere else in the world. It's critically endangered. There's about 800 individuals living in this tiny lake there in Argentina. And if this bird species goes extinct from this area, it's a it's extinction, essentially. You mentioned that there was a kind of inclusion process that was supposed to have happened between the construction of the dam and the Mapuche people. This is a thing that's present in a lot of construction in more remote regions. Can you explain what that looks like and what that law or regulation is and how common it might be in a lot of these cases? With any major development project, be it a hydropower dam or a mining project or a highway, if there's any kind of major construction to be done with a development project, the project developer has to do an environmental impact assessment. And through this, they send biologists out into the field. They do an assessment of what type of biodiversity species are out there, what kind of habitats, what type of ecosystem services. And from that, they have to create a report to show what types of environmental impacts we would do. And with this also, they have to interview people living in the area because they're also affected with this development, right? And there's clear guidelines on how public participation should be done, primarily that people living there should have free prior and informed consent, and they should be able to actually deny the access to them losing their lands. But unfortunately, we see that this isn't done very thoroughly in most cases. Environmental impact assessments, or EIAs, are basic requirements for most development projects in most countries. I've worked with cases from Sweden, where I'm based specifically on a mining project where 
in northern Sweden, they were cutting down old growth forests to open up an iron ore mine. And then the indigenous Sami people were also being affected by this and they had to do an environmental impact assessment. Mm. But I've also looked at cases in Laos and Southeast Asia, where a hydropower dam was being built and the indigenous people living in the area were also affected. To halt construction on the dam in Argentina, Nyak explained that the most obvious legal strategy would have been to argue that the dam would damage the hooded grebe's habitat, and therefore does not comply with Argentina's commitment to halt species extinction under the Convention on Biological Diversity. But instead, the Mapuche people worked with an environmental organization to contact the UN Human Rights Council. Together, they argued that the dam was violating their human right to live in and make their livelihoods from their own ancestral land. This strategy of merging environmental concerns with human rights law has become increasingly common in the past few years. The human rights argument is really strong because, I mean, it's people's rights to live on the lands that they belong to, their ancestral lands. So there's a very strong connection between the length of human rights and biodiversity. Hmm. So we've got this bird, the hooded grebe, we've got the Mapuche people, we've got this dam construction going on. What happens next? So essentially, the dam was funded by big funding agencies in China. This is part of the Belt and Road Initiative that China is building, hmm. and this is one of the hubs in Argentina. The Belt and Road Initiative is a global infrastructure program that China has been using to build trade and political and economic ties with nations across the world. So it's also the political aspect of it that is part of this development project. But essentially, the environmental NGO found out that the environmental impact assessment wasn't done in a very clear way. Mm. And they used this argument to stop the development of the dam. They brought this to the judicial level of the Argentinian courts. So they did it at one step up to the national level. And from there, they were actually able to say that we need to stop the construction of the dam because we need to do a proper EIA assessment. They realized that China was having its human rights record reviewed that year. So they actually brought this particular case to the Human Rights Universal Periodic Review mm. to show that China was upholding its human rights obligations in this Argentina because they were the ones funding the dam. And they also brought it to the Argentina perspective to... I mean, it was a complementary in that sense, right? Both for Argentina and China. This is where it gets a little tricky. A human rights peer review isn't legally binding, but Nyak says that doesn't mean it has no effect. So it's about carrots and sticks in a way, right? Mm. By bringing it to the universal periodic review, it's on record now. And they'll have to follow up every time they do a new review of the cycle to see what's the status of that. Have they actually improved on their record? What are they doing about it? You know, where are they in terms of the implementation? So it's about really making it very public and transparent and bringing attention to the case that they have to do something to address it. So the stick here in this carrot and stick situation is the bad PR and possible political fallout from negative human rights cases. And the carrot is the opportunity to do good elsewhere. One really big aspect of my work is safeguards, both environmental and social mm. safeguards. This means that essentially, if you're going to have any kind of development, you have to make sure that you do a checklist of things that are good for both people and biodiversity. And one of these mm. easy wins, so to say, is an offset. So it's either called a biodiversity offset or environmental compensation. But essentially, it's based on this idea that the project developer has to compensate for their impacts on biodiversity. Hmm. And this means that first, they have to quantify the amount of biodiversity impact that they're going to have through the environmental impact assessment. They have to avoid, minimize and restore all of that. And it's the residual impacts that are remaining that they have to compensate somewhere else. And this can be done in terms of protecting an area, restoring an area. But essentially, I think it's a very powerful tool in our current economic paradigm because it links the biodiversity loss to conservation action. Biodiversity offsets are similar to carbon offsets. And as with carbon offsets, there is some potential for abuse. So if it's a bad biodiversity offset, it can be a license to trash. And there's very clear guidelines around like what is a good and a bad offset. So we see that there are many established biodiversity offsets all over the world. It can be done in different ways, but the base idea is that if a project developer is going to have any kind of impact on the environment, they have to compensate a similar kind of nature somewhere else. And this can be done in terms of a market-based approach, where there is sort of like a, an environmental bank, if you think about it that way, where they go out, they do the restoration activities, and then they sell those credits to somebody else. Or it can be done with a more of a state-based approach, which we see in Germany, where the government is the one in charge of actually making sure that the losses and gains are matched together. 
Another very clear example I've worked with is both in Sweden and in Madagascar, where there's examples of mining projects, where a mining project has an impact on cutting down forest, and they have to compensate a similar kind of forest area nearby as close as possible. Okay, so that seems somewhat tangible, actually, right? You cut down a forest, you plant a new forest, it's kind of similar. Or you... Oh, but it's not planting a new forest. That, that's also a key distinction oh. there, right? So it's a mix of protection and restoration. Primarily, it should be protection mm. because essentially... I mean, restoring or, you know, planting trees takes a long time. You mentioned in the article you and your colleague wrote for us inequities and inequality as central to the idea of conservation and biodiversity. Can you explain how those two ideas fit together? So if I go back to the example of the hydropower dam, right? I mentioned that these dams or any kind of project development with resource extraction, they often tend to happen in very remote places, you know, so places that are far away from cities. And there's an inequality there because who benefits from these projects and who loses, right? People who benefit are usually the project developer because they make money off the development, governments that take a cut from the resource extraction, people in cities like me and you who can gain access to resources. But often the losses are felt by these people who are living in these very rural areas. And they're already very vulnerable because they live out there. They tend to live off the land. It's their main source of livelihood. And then this company comes in and, you know, cuts down the forest or stops the water from flowing. Right. So there's a very big inequality in terms of who benefits and who loses. And also, if you think about the environmental impact assessment, how do we know that it's done in a thorough way? Right. So these power inequities are something that we try to tease out in our work and really point to the issue of that conservation is conservation, but also it's people that are being affected. So the question is, can this approach of thorough and transparent environmental impact assessments and seeking permission from local populations actually work? Or do the local people always get the short end of the stick? And the answer, as you probably guess, is that it depends. One case where it has been successful, for the most part, is the mining project Nyak mentioned in northern Sweden with the Sami people. From our interviews with the Sami people, they were very happy with this agreement because one, it set a legal precedence, and all mining that happens in the area now has to follow the same kind of procedures. And with these monthly meetings, the Sami people were also compensated for their time to attend the meeting, right? Because time they spend mm. going to a meeting for mining company is time that they're not spending for their own livelihoods. Sure, yeah. So I think that there was a lot of clauses that were built into this agreement that were very um, innovative, actually. Unfortunately, in the case of the dam in Argentina, so far, things aren't working quite as well for the Mapuche people. The courts have recognized that the environmental impact assessment was not done up to speed. They had to go in and pause the development while they do more proper guidelines and make sure that you know it's done in a clear way. So the case has been pending for the past five years. Hmm. And the project developer, from their perspective, is very expensive, right? Obviously, they want the dam construction to continue as fast as possible. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, because the dam is in a very remote area, construction has um, quietly continued and it's difficult to enforce. Mm -hmm. So the project developer is essentially slowly continuing. So I find this idea of connecting human rights to environmental issues quite interesting and also somewhat hopeful. But it seems really localized and happens on a small scale. You're right. So far, it has been mostly on localized scales. But a lot of activists and legal scholars are starting to use this idea of human rights and environmental and climate issues as a model to bring cases to the international level. And this is through places like the UN and other international courts. That makes sense because climate change isn't a local issue. It affects people everywhere in different ways. But are there any precedents here for these kinds of cases? Well, to find out the answer to whether there's any precedents for something like this and how this process is going, I spoke to one of the legal experts who is part of the team that is bringing a case forward to the UN's International Court of Justice, and I'll let her explain. My name is Zoe May. I'm a PhD candidate with Melbourne Law School and a research fellow with the Melbourne Climate Futures Research Centre at the University of Melbourne. My research, broadly speaking, examines the role of law in addressing environmental challenges. Specifically, I focus on the intersection between climate change law and the law of the sea. So my doctoral research focuses on state responsibility for climate harms in Pacific Island states. Zoe is also part of the academic advisory team for a non-governmental organization called World Youth for Climate Justice. 
they are a group behind a case currently before the UN's International Court of Justice, or ICJ. In this case, Vanuatu, a small Pacific island, as well as a group of other Pacific island nations, are asking the court to advise on whether nations have an obligation, a legal international obligation, to prevent climate change. And Zoe explains a little bit about the context of the case. Pacific island states, cumulatively, have contributed less than 0.03% of greenhouse gas emissions globally. But they're really at the front lines of a lot of the worst impacts of climate change. If you think of climate change, you think of things like sea level rise, but also increasingly worse cyclones and flooding and storms. You have ocean acidification contributing to biodiversity loss. So the Pacific Island states are a group in the Pacific Ocean region of really low-lying coastal states. A lot of their populations are concentrated around coastal areas, which means sea level rise impacts not only their infrastructure, but also their ways of life, their food security, and their connection to place. Already, we're seeing some islands being inundated by sea level rise. And in the future, we might be looking at climate displacement in the region or climate mobility, where people have to move from, you know, the lands they grew up on, their ancestral lands to different places because of climate change. I mean, Vanuatu just got hit by two big cyclones, right? Like, this isn't some academic thought experiment here. Like, it's happening now, to your point, right? That's it. So for the Pacific Island states, this isn't really just a legal question. This is a question of their lives and livelihoods, their ways of being. For them, sea level rise, increasing flooding, these are things that are now daily occurrences that they're having to adapt to. But because finance isn't coming in for that adaptation, they're bearing the costs already. When we talk about allocating responsibility, people think that's when the cost is coming in. But the costs are already being borne by those most vulnerable and without the resources to really respond in a way that keeps the sense of community and their ways of life intact. So the stakes could not be higher for Vanuatu and the Pacific Island nations as they bring their case before the ICJ. The ICJ is located in The Hague and is composed of 15 judges from around the world. It is the UN's principal judicial mechanism and is considered the world's highest court. The court can hear cases that are contentious, where one state is suing another for some sort of action or compensation, but states can also ask the court for an advisory opinion on a legal question, in which case the court will render an authoritative judgment on the interpretation of international law and indicate what that law means for countries around the world as well as what it could mean into the future. This advisory opinion is the sort of judgment that Vanuatu is seeking. Getting a case before the court can be a long journey, though, as Zoe explains. In order to bring a case before the International Court of Justice, you need an international body to bring that resolution. In this case, they were bringing it before the United Nations General Assembly. So you need a simple majority of states. What that means in basic terms is a lot more states than those in the Pacific had to agree to bring this resolution. Essentially, they were looking for a simple majority, Mm. but what we ended up getting was a full consensus. So this is the first time that the United Nations General Assembly has ever had a full consensus from states to bring a request for an advisory opinion. This is much more than a historic moment of unity behind these Pacific Island states. It reflects a shift in thinking about climate change that has been many years in the making. In 2011, Palau was attempting to bring a case to the International Court of Justice, an advisory opinion at the time, but that didn't go ahead because of political pushback from some major players. So what changed between 2011, when a similar resolution couldn't get a simple majority, to March 2023's full consensus vote? In 2015, the Paris Agreement was adopted, which is the major international framework setting out what state's duties are in addressing climate change, so in reducing greenhouse gas emissions, but also in adapting to climate impacts that are already occurring and that can occur in the future. But on the back of that, climate action still wasn't enough from states. You know, we weren't on a trajectory to keep greenhouse gas emissions below a level that's really dangerous, especially for those most vulnerable to climate change and often who have contributed least. 
And so in 2019, you had the Pacific Islands Youth Fighting Climate Change. They formed a coalition. It was all law students all across the Pacific. And they brought a campaign to the Vanuatu government seeking to reinvigorate this effort to have an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice. And that's where this whole campaign really started off. Okay, so walk me through the process of the ICJ, the International Court of Justice. What does it actually look like? Yeah, so the case is a little bit different than what you think of as a jury trial for a normal case in Australia, say. They'll hear scientific evidence about climate change, so there will be a lot of expert evidence there. But all of the judges are lawyers with legal training, so they're really trying to interpret the law in this advisory opinion. States will probably make submissions about how they conceive the interpretation of the law, the impacts of climate change on them, and the obligations under international law. And then there's a process where the judges will go back and provide what is an authoritative opinion on the interpretation of this question. And the body of legal work that these judges are looking at, international law, right? We're talking treaties, agreements, UN binding resolutions, that kind of thing? Yeah, So one of the really powerful aspects about bringing this campaign to the world's highest court is the fact that it's not limited to looking at one specific treaty regime. So in the campaign and in the resolution, they've asked to look at not only climate change law, but also human rights law, the law of the sea, customary international law, which looks at general obligations of states. So all of those things will be threaded into the judgment. Not only that, we're already having a lot of cases come from domestic regional courts giving interpretations of climate change obligations and their intersections with other areas of law like human rights law. And so the hope is that these progressive developments of climate change law and human rights law will be taken into account as the International Court of Justice is rendering its decision. The ICJ has addressed various environmental issues in the past, but this is the first time that the global problem of climate change itself has come before the court. So this is a really important moment for the world's highest court to deliver its judgment on the interpretation of climate change obligations. The environmental impacts are not from one state to another. You know, it's really diffuse across the globe. And it has these intergenerational impacts being inequitable impacts for certain states like the Pacific, but also intragenerational impacts, impacts on future generations. And that's the first time the court has been asked to rule on that issue too. Even with the unanimous support of the UN General Assembly, the outcome of this case is by no means guaranteed. It's definitely uncharted waters bringing it to the International Court of Justice. And there are some risks in doing so. Obviously, you know, we want a positive judgment, but they have interpretation leeway. The precedent that they're building on is this body of domestic and regional cases that have really gained traction in the last few years. These types of cases that Zoe is referring to are like the ones that Nyok was talking about earlier. Obviously, that's a different level. We have from the domestic to the regional, the international will be the highest court delivering its judgment. It's the authority on this, but it will take into consideration these earlier precedents. Still, simply being brought forth, the case has already accomplished one of its biggest goals. The results of a case are not necessarily just dependent on the judgment. I think one really powerful aspect of this campaign is it's garnered a lot of public attention. With an issue like climate change, obviously we want systemic issues from governments, but also bottom-up action from different corporations, public groups, individual action. And this has really brought climate change and its inequitable impacts on the Pacific to the forefront of people's minds. I also think it can really influence negotiations going forward. The climate negotiations have hit a bit of a standstill when it comes to some contested issues largely revolving around responsibility and climate finance. So I think this serves as an incentive to move forward negotiations. And then at the same time, one of the most powerful aspects of the Paris Agreement is the nationally determined contributions submitted by parties. They're becoming increasingly more ambitious, but not enough in order to put us on a pathway that prevents dangerous climate change. This case sort of provides the incentive for states to scale up their ambition, and not only that, to translate their ambition into tangible action. That's not to say that the ruling itself is irrelevant, though. 
This could provide a really great recognition of the impacts of climate change on human rights law, the law of the sea, these different areas, so that going forward in these cases that are contentious climate litigation, they can have that backing behind them of this is what the international court said and thus we're applying this in future cases. I think that's one of the greatest potentials of the case. The ICJ opinion is expected to take about 12 to 16 months, and due to the uniqueness of the case, it's really hard to anticipate what the results of the ruling might be. So the decision, hopefully, will clarify what states are required to do in terms of mitigating their greenhouse gas emissions, providing support to developing nations, and then also providing finance for loss and damage and climate harms in the region. Though this is just an advisory opinion, it would provide a basis for future contentious litigation. For instance, if Vanuatu wanted to sue Australia or the US for not meeting climate obligations. Obviously, climate change obligations are broad in their nature. So the International Court of Justice might not necessarily say this is exactly what states need to do, specifically because states have contributed differently to the problem of climate change and also have different capacities to address it. And so what's required from one state is not necessarily the same as what's required from another. So work may still need to be done in clarifying some of these obligations, but hopefully this is one step forward in creating a more just climate future, but also a clearer legal landscape for cases and negotiations. So it's great that this case is being heard by the ICJ. But how does that actually translate to an impact at the local scale? I wonder this constantly every time I hear about international law, right? There's terrible things happening all over the world and countries and organizations breaking international law. But how does it translate to change on the ground? Who is going to enforce it and how? Right. And should we even be thinking about enforcement at that level? No, that's a really good point. So to find out answers to these questions, I reached out to a sociologist who has a lot of experience working with human rights movements. And the first thing she said about how these changes are implemented was kind of surprising. The best way to think about how change happens in this system is to understand that governments are not good enforcers of rights. Hmm. They never have been. They've never led in terms of building human rights treaties, at least in terms of how those treaties might impact their own behavior. They might advance them in order to affect the behavior of other governments. But in terms of being able to police themselves, they're terrible. My name is Jackie Smith. I'm a sociologist at the University of Pittsburgh. I also organize with my community as part of the Pittsburgh Human Rights City Alliance. And we're also part of a national network of human rights leaders working across cities to support the work of local advocates to bring human rights home, to translate international laws into local practices. As one of my co-organizers likes to say, we are the enforcers of human rights law. We being the people. Yes. Hmm. So we need to know what our rights are, and we need to know how to pursue those rights, to defend those rights in whatever legal arrangements we have. And if we don't have those legal mechanisms, we've got to work to build or strengthen them. So then how do the people enforce that? What does that look like, and how does that translate to actual change on the ground? So the enforcement, like any enforcement, requires power. And that's what movements are doing, not always self-consciously, trying to get the ability to, first you have to be able to monitor performance Mm -hmm. and have access to the information that you need to monitor governments and other powerful actors. So corporations are able to use the law to shield themselves from scrutiny. So you can see all the levels of power that are at play and how the existing system really reinforces the powerful groups against those who might be trying to advocate for rights of people and nature, because this system was organized, as we remember, to exploit nature and exploit people. So the law, as most of it is written, is really reinforcing that. And so people's movements and human rights efforts are trying to push those basic ideas of who the law Mm. serves and shift it 
in a different direction. Jackie offered what was, at least to me, a surprising example of this. Even thinking about the U.S. Constitution, it was written by slaveholders and by people who maybe didn't own slaves, but were willing to accept this arrangement because they were making money from this system that relied upon the exploitation of human labor. But we're still seeing that basic contradiction between what we think of as people's rights, the right to be free from racial discrimination, and the legal system that isn't set up to protect that right. The recognition of this contradiction, Jackie says, is the first step to changing power dynamics. Ideas are really important sources of power. You can have hard power, or, you know, military coercive power, but if you don't have ideas that get people to accept your authority and your ability to use that force as legitimate, it doesn't matter how much military force you have because people won't accept your authority. This kind of flips the script on the conception of how power works in the world. But in Jackie's work, she's found that there is a lot of historical basis for this type of thinking. A lot of times in international relations, we think about states coming first and then creating rules for how states will work out their differences. So the UN just happened and states wrote the UN treaty that created it. And that's how things work. But it's usually a lot more complex than that. In my work, I've traced a long history of human rights advocacy that predates modern states and it predates the UN by far. This struggle is part of human history, even if it's less well documented than the history that is recorded by elites and states. So we can speak about people as always being engaged in this effort to define relationships between powerful groups and less powerful groups, and to define norms that govern how people should be treated and what basic rights everybody should have in any decent, civilized community. The idea of changing norms is key to understanding how society-wide changes occur. As the idea of what is acceptable within a society evolves through grassroots movements, the law tends to move in that direction as well, albeit a bit slower. The legal changes continue to shift the balance of power and continually increase the speed of change. When we're thinking about something like the Vanuatu ruling, that shift in what is considered acceptable and how people think about climate change is perhaps in many ways more important than the law being enforceable. And Jackie offered a really powerful historical example of this. You know, the very first example that comes to my mind is the anti-slavery movement. Hmm. And that precedes by a long shot the United Nations and the system of international law that we have, although there's treaties that reflect, you know, bans on the slave trade that are respected and part of international law today. And that started from the grassroots and was about activists building power to push elite players to shift and to decide that, no, you can't own human property. You can't engage in this kind of activity, and we're going to take steps to make sure that you don't. Hmm. So to me, it's a little surprising to hear you say that the abolishment of slavery and this push for environmental change through human rights have a lot of parallels. Could you explain that a little bit more here? Sociologists, and in particular a field called world systems analysis, understands today's political and social order as shaped very much by the history of this global capitalist system that depends upon certain kinds of exploitative relationships, extraction of profits through the manipulation of nature. So the extraction of fossil fuels or minerals from the soil, the use of timber. So the exploitation of nature is really critical to historical development of capitalism. We couldn't have this economic system if you didn't decide that humans could use nature in this way. And in order to even exploit nature as humans did historically, you needed also to exploit human labor. Mm. And so to cut down the forests, to get the fuel to do the 
mining way back at the time of Columbus and before, that was all dependent on two kinds of exploitation, exploitation of nature, exploitation of humans. And so what the law that we're talking about is trying to do is to set norms or to redefine norms about these relations, these social relations, to say that in the existing order, it's acceptable to exploit nature. It was also acceptable to exploit human labor under slavery. And now it's acceptable to continue perpetuating the inequities that result from slavery. So law is a tool for trying to change those norms and to remedy the results of them. So I imagine there's a big role to play of the social pressure or like the shamefulness of doing things that have shifted away from being normal or acceptable, right? So are international legal movements a piece of that puzzle? And do they kind of shift the social norms and say, no, that's actually not okay. And we can point to that resolution the UN passed to tell you it's not okay to do X, Y, Z, whether it might be slavery or certain human rights abuses and inequalities that are around today or environmental stuff too. Because I got to imagine there's kind of a shifting of the like, what is generally accepted by the world as okay. And once that shifts, it's pretty hard to keep doing the terrible things you were doing before. So is that kind of where I'm, am I picking this up right? Exactly. And in the activist world, we talk a lot about naming and shaming, pointing to offenders and calling them out and calling for change. And that is definitely a big and important part of what happens with the idea that those actions will be seen as not acceptable and they'll conform to a new set of norms that we're putting forward. Given your knowledge of the historical human rights situations in other cases, how are we looking with the environmental human rights stuff? Well, all of this work takes a long time, but I think there's a much longer historical runway, if you will, to the story of environmental advocacy in the international context than people realize. So we see it as kind of a blip in history rather than as part of something bigger. So what's happening now is we have a lot of activism, a lot of you know really good historical foundations for advocacy and strong movements that are, unlike earlier movements, pretty well connected and crossing issue divides and certainly in crossing national boundaries in ways that we never could in the past, you know, with our technologies and the kinds of organizations that have been developing over recent decades learning how to work internationally. While Jackie sees these strong networks of activists as good reason for hope, she's also quick to point out that a ruling from a court, even the world's highest court, isn't the moment to say mission accomplished and walk away. Rather, it's the beginning of the next step in this process. We say in the human rights cities movement, human rights don't trickle down, they rise up. And I think one of the mistakes that some activists have made is to think that you can pass a resolution or even a law at the UN level or even in a national government and expect it to be carried out as you'd like. In reality, even in national law, that doesn't play out. You know, if you want to see a law enforced, you need to make sure that you're attending hearings and following through the executive branch to see what's going on. That process happens in the UN as well. And so for our movements to really see follow through on some of the good resolutions that have been passed or treaties that have been passed require us to do that monitoring and to participate in that process and to involve more local folks in that process. With your experience in these areas and kind of where we are at in terms of the environmental movement, are you optimistic? Are you pessimistic? Are you optimistic with a caveat here? Well, I think we all have to be optimistic for it to work. And I'm optimistic enough to spend as much energy as I can on doing this work. But the powers that we're up against are very strong and they've been upholding this very profitable for them system for a very long time. And so, you know, I think it's really going to require many more people to realize that if we want a better world, we are the defenders. We are the ones we've been waiting for. 
That's it for this episode. Thank you to all of the academics we spoke to this week, Nyak Siang Ko, Zoe Nay, and Jackie Smith. You can find us on Twitter at TC underscore audio, on Instagram at theconversation.com, or email us, podcast at theconversation.com. If you like what we do, please support our podcast and the conversation more broadly by going to donate.theconversation.com. This episode of The Conversation Weekly was produced and written by Katie Flood. Sound design was by Eloise Stevens, and our theme music is by Nita Sarl. Stephen Kahn is our global executive editor. Alice Mason runs our social media, and Soraya Nandy does our transcripts. Mend Marwani is the show's executive producer, and I am Dan Marino. I'm Nihal Al-Hadi. Thank you for listening.